Welcome to our discussion. I am George Mavridis. I am tech journalist and social media manager for Forai Magazine. Um, as you may already know, October is Cyber Security Awareness Month. And Forai Magazine has prepared a set of three uh, webinars to discuss issues related to cyber security. Uh, this is our third and the last one webinar for today. And uh, with me, I have uh, Courtney Cohen and Christy Sehu. Welcome, girls. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having Thank us. us. <laughs> Great. So we're about to discuss uh, prioritize and predict your third party risk. And first, I would like to introduce you to our audience and then we can just start our uh, discussion. As I told you, we have with us Courtney Cohen. She's a senior director of product at Cyber at GRX. Um, she is a former data manager consultant who cultivated strategic organizational partnerships with the Gates Foundation, international NGOs, national government, and USG. She transitioned from international relations and crisis and disaster management to cybersecurity, where she now primarily focuses on translating the third party risk management needs of enterprises to better design experience and future development. And we are really happy that we have you here with us today, uh, Courtney. So welcome. Thank you. And thank you for that intro. We also have with us Christy Sehu. Christy is a cybersecurity engineer profiled in web application security, currently based in Albania, working for one of the largest companies handling projects for national government, financial industry, and so on. She has transitioned from her early career in digital marketing and content creation to working as a cybersecurity engineer and also as a cyber journalist for 4 Mac. And now she has dedicated her time and career towards application security engineer and creating content to raise awareness for different cyber risks. So welcome, Christy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the lovely presentation, George. And happy to be here. Yeah. So uh, we, uh, as, I, as I told you, we're about to uh, discuss how to prioritize and predict your third party risks. So my first question uh, for you, Courtney, is why uh, is third party cyber risk management so important? You know, I think that is something that we could have an all day long discussion about, but to keep it kind of short and sweet, I'll just kind of leave it to the stats that we've been seeing get even more increasing over the last few years, but somewhere between 60 to 7%, 70% of all attacks that we're seeing are coming through a, a third party entry point. And so as that vulnerability of exploitation kind of continues to grow, and in addition, more and more businesses are, are outsourcing a lot of niche services and products that are core to their business. We see that there's becoming a much more prolific threat as a result of that dynamic and threat actors are finding more and more creative ways to, to leverage those multiple entry points and those multiple vendors and that growing vendor ecosystem. So we have to try to get our arms around the problem and stay on top of the problem. Otherwise, this could definitely run away from us uh, and have some pretty devastating effects as, as we've seen. So trying to be proactive and um, thorough is been really the name of the game. Mm -hmm. Christy, what do you think? Well, I totally agree. And the thing is to fully grasp the concept of the third party risk management is to understand third party services and providers, vendors which are basically entities that a company or other person service, et cetera, provides a service for us or the business or the company organization in itself in order to improve or optimize the efficiency of the workflow. And basically when we're talking about third-party risk management, we're talking about the process of analyzing and controlling these risks that are coming or that are associated with the third-party vendors or service providers. And the thing is, this is why third-party risk is very important is because uh, if we fail to manage or, or if we fail to assess the risk that is coming from these third party services, then we can be uh, exposed to different risks such uh, as data breaches or reputational damages, financial costs, et cetera, et cetera. So the impact of it can be quite, quite large, honestly. Mm -hmm. So Christy, uh, what are the challenges of staying ahead of threat actors? 
of, there are so many actually, and it depends on the organization. It depends on the way that they are integrated. We can have like a very long talk just about the challenges of staying ahead of the, these trajectories. But uh, basically today we can say that companies are impl implementing integrating uh, hundreds of vendors uh, inside their workly everyday process. And uh, the thing is, the, with the, all this use of the third-party vendors, uh, you can also have uh, very high chances of risks at any time. Uh, the challenge is, is that uh, for this specific kind of vendors, you have to have like regular assessments and risk assessments that you have to do on a regular period of time in order to assess the risk and just to remediate the risk or mitigate the risk and come up with different uh, recommendations, let's say. And also there is not only about the technical part or the vulnerability part, but it's also connected with different types of forms of risks. It's also connected with the part of uh, financial risk that might come from a specific vendor. It's also connected with the legal part of risk that is connected with the third party vendor, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing is we have to stay ahead of the threat factors by analyzing and risk assessments uh, through every single vendor that there is implemented into our everyday work process in order to stay ahead of everything, in order to specify the needs that we have to do or the requirements that we should follow in order to prevent risk from happening in the first place. Courtney, what do you believe? I would absolutely echo everything Christy just said. And I think, as she mentioned, there are risks at every stage in the third party risk management lifecycle. And one thing that we see with a lot of our users is that people often don't even know who their vendors are. And so that first challenge is even getting a full understanding of who all is in your vendor ecosystem and who you need to be aware of and what risks you need to be aware of and, and start that mitigation conversation about. So that comes with a lot of not only data access, but then data curation to fully understand who is this vendor, what sort of relationship do you have with them? And ergo, what sort of access to your core assets and data do they have access to? Because that's going to inform what a priority of a third party they are to you. And then to kind of, you know, take what Christy said even further, as far as staying on top of it, is these threat actors are smart. They know that we are trying to prevent ways and methods that they've used in the past, and they're trying to get more creative uh, and, and more surprising about what they're they're employing to find ways into our systems. And so we need to beat them at their own game and be more creative. We cannot reside on uh, methodology that has worked in the past or tools that have worked in the past because they are getting very quickly outpaced and our only option is to stay on pace with them. And so um, it's a challenge because we, we don't really know what they're going to do next, but we need to have a pretty good sense of what they're going to do. And we need to find a way to prioritize where we're going to target our resources. Because as we know, a lot of these teams are already stretched really thin. And so asking them to go above and beyond and try to solve something that might look like a bit of a mystery right now, it's a really tough investment. It's a really tough call to make. And so finding a way to try to find some criteria on where you're going to prioritize those resources is really, really key and making sure that you ultimately have a meaningful investment and a meaningful impact on that that risk landscape that you're working within uh, and making sure that you're making the best informed decisions you can when there is still a lot of question marks around the variables you're working around. So Courtney, how can we be proactive about managing the risk our third parties bring into our environment? What do you think? I think first of all is getting a full view into what sort of risk that vendor is bringing into your organization. So again, that's going to come with what type of relationship you have with them. How are you employing them? What sort of data and assets are they getting access to as a result of that partnership? And then understanding what does that mean for you then if that third party is to incur a sort of attack or any other cybersecurity event. So we're looking at both what is their risk inherently as a vendor? And what is that risk impact to your organization? And again, it's going to be that, that double-sided uh, conversation of what do I need to know about them? What does it matter to me? And what am I taking to that third party back as a priority as far as that constructive cooperative conversation of this is not acceptable. This is what we need you to remediate. This is what type, sort of timeframe we're looking at. 
And then I think Chrissy already mentioned it too, that we've had these kind of methodologies that are not sufficient on a timing perspective. The annual assessment is something we've normalized, but we're finding that's not sufficient. We need to stay on top of a continuous monitoring, a continuous evaluation, a continuous conversation, because we don't want to just rest on our laurels, so to speak, that, oh, we checked you out once and you're stable. It's not stable. We've got so many new factors getting introduced all the time uh, that that risk landscape can be very volatile. That status can be very volatile as well. And we need to make sure that um, we have clear visibility into what's happening and what we need to respond to accordingly so that we understand not only what the risk is, but what it, what it means to us specifically. Christy, what's your perspective on how to be proactive? Actually, what everything Courtney just said, it's about developing like a strong strategy for optimizing the third party management risk. Basically to have a clear plan on how we're going to approach this type of uh, risk, let's say, or this type of issue, if we can put it this way. And uh, let's take, for example, uh, in my point of view, for example, the software's point of view. In uh, while creating the software, while um, creating and maintaining the software, you have, on average, it's on average, and that's the statistics, is that uh, you can have at least uh, a minimum 200 uh, third-party vendors implemented, integrated inside your software supply chain. But the thing is, uh, and that's a problem actually, that's an issue, is that most of the times all of these uh, assessments and the risk assessment that should be done at the beginning of the process of the whole process of creating the software, is done at the end of it or after the software is created. And then they say, okay, let's do a risk assessment at this point. But the thing is, we should be proactive about it. We should take every single third-party vendor that we want to integrate and to do a full risk assessment of it. Basically, we have to know about the party who wrote this, who actually contributed into it, who was the person who added more into this and committed the new issues. Uh, if there is uh, any vulnerability that is exposed, if we're dealing with unsupported versions, the licensing of everything, basically speaking from a technical point of view, these things uh, often uh, tend to get overlooked at by developers, for example, or other people. And the thing is, we have to change that. We have to prioritize this thing and to make it part of the whole risk assessment management plan of the third party vendors because there are so many ways we can be impacted directly just from vulnerabilities, non-vulnerabilities from third-party vendors that are completely connected with uh, our end. For example, if we find a third-party vendor that is integrated inside our software and has a non-vulnerability or exposure that is exposed, for example, to data leak, that also impacts us immediately as a company organization that has integrated this third-party component into our own software. And not just only by the uh vulnerability that is the our information getting exposed but also it impacts a lot of other stuff it loses loses the credibility of the user it impacts on the costs of everything basically financial costs you will lose money if you have this sort of issue and at the end of the day it also uh, is uh, connected with the legal part of it basically if you are compliant or not towards the data protection and such sort of thing happens for example and your data get leaks, then of course, immediately you will be uh, at fault if we can put it this way. Uh, even though it was the vulnerability of the third party vendor, you get impacted as well. So basically everything is a chain and it's connected. That's why we have to get ahead of it and uh, find of new ways of methods of uh, risk assessing everything, every third party vendor that comes into our organization. So, uh... Courtney, what vectors are you seeing leverage to break into third parties? What do you think? I think, as you mentioned, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that can be exploited, but the, the actors are going to find the, the means of extortion that are going to resonate the most deeply with an organization. So as Chrissy kind of hit on, anything that's going to have a fiscal uh, consequence or reputational consequence is obviously going to compel the, the victims of these attacks to comply more frequently than if it's something that was a little bit more hidden or doesn't have the sort of ripple effect that one of these attacks might might incur. Um, I also think we talked about the supply chain quite a lot. Um, as we mentioned, as more and more companies outsource more and more niche components of their business, now we're getting a much bigger kind of domino effect of one fourth party, sixth party, 10th party down the line, whatever it may be, 
could have a meaningful impact on your business. And we need to bring more visibility and more awareness to that. That is not something that is easy to do. I want to make that very clear, but it's something that's becoming much more difficult to avoid. And I think even with the supply chain issues that we're seeing in the kind of physical supply world with COVID and everything showing there's a global connection, like Christy said, and if one of those connections becomes weak or falls down, we feel it all, all around the world in a variety of different sectors. The same thing is happening with software supply chains as well. And so we need to be a little bit more aware and a little bit more resolute and kind of fortifying those avenues of supply so that it's not just vendor risk, it's supplier risk that we're aware of, we're being proactive about, and we're having the necessary conversations because you can't fix what you can't acknowledge and then you can't acknowledge something you can't see. So um, just trying to have more visibility and a better understanding of, of how those interconnectivities play together so that users can make the most informed and like I said, meaningful decisions around what they wanna do for their own organization's context. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Christy? Well, actually I couldn't agree more about this topic. And uh, as we already addressed this issue, I think the the risks are enormous and of course the impact of it are even more enormous from it. But if we can take it from a point of view, from the risks point of view that come from third party vendors, then of course we're talking about risks that not only come as Courtney said, as uh, financial or reputational risks, but we're also coming, uh, we're seeing it at other points of view, such as for example, operational risks or legal and uh, uh, other legally uh, vulnerabilities that we may face, et cetera, et cetera. So basically we are dealing with the different types of risk that even if we face just one single vulnerability in these third party vendors or just one single issue with them, uh, it may lead to a complete uh, nightmare or disaster for the whole business or the organization. And of course we can face even more greater uh, vulnerabilities or even greater attacks that can lead us uh, to business uh, disruption, to data leaks, data breaches, et cetera, et cetera. So the possibilities are endless. That's why we need to stay ahead of it and find new ways in order to prevent this from happening in the first place. So Courtney, uh, how do you identify what control gaps need to be remediated in order to be secure? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think something that a lot of people have tried to answer in a variety of different ways. So as a result, we have a variety of different tools and solutions and data sources that are trying to answer that question. And what users and organizations need to do is decide what is most appropriate for your organization and for the relationships that you're working with with your vendors. Uh, at CyberGX specifically, I can speak to, you know, we started with an inside out questionnaire as part of our solution. But I think as most people know, those questionnaires can be very difficult and slow to come by. And so we decided to provide some outside in information as well. So we're pulling in external scanning and threat intelligence data sources. We've also built our own predictive data model using those data partnerships as well as our own cache of inside out data to predict what we think uh, a vendor's residual risk in their control coverage gaps might look like. And so these multitude of, of data sources and, and points of insight have created what we try to call a 360 degree view of risk. Mm -hmm. So that if one is not available or if one is not you know, as recent as you would like it to be to rely on that data source, you can supplement it with these other points of information. And as a result, kind of fill in the gap about what you know about that third party and then line it up with you know, the MITRE attack framework so that you can understand what are the techniques that might be used to exploit that, that gap in their control coverage, what use cases are relevant to you as far as what that gap is going to allow to happen. And again, use that to not only understand where your vulnerabilities lie, but which ones matter most to you and provide the most comprehensive uh, view into what is possible as far as that, that vendor ecosystem providing vulnerabilities that can be exploited and then incurring uh, some consequences for your organization. So it's not unfortunately a silver bullet. I think we have to take a very sophisticated and multifaceted approach to answer that question. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Christy? Well, I actually agree. And the thing is, uh, it's uh, as Courtney said, it's not going to 
be easy, but it's something that should be done. And uh, the whole process of it should go through the stages, which is to do a fully proper assessment inventory or risk assessment of the whole third party vendors that are going to be integrated inside your business or organization to do a background check on everything to see the who created, as I said before, this uh, vendors. If we have any sort of issues with them, to check also for dependencies, to do a throughout dependency analysis of all these third party vendors that we are about to implement or have already implemented into our own systems and to just identify every everything, every risk that comes with them. And uh, by identifying and conducting security tests and risk assessments, then we can also mitigate the risk, which is give recommendations in order to improve the whole efficiency and the whole security of the organization company where we are, we are at. Mm -hmm. Based on your experience, Courtney, um, what is the legacy approach for third-party cyber risk management and what are organizations doing wrong today? What do you think? I think the historical approach that I see most often with our users is that annual questionnaire-based approach so that once a year, let me evaluate and assess using this questionnaire that I think third-party supplied third-party attested data is very valuable, but we still cannot guarantee the truthfulness or the accuracy of that data. Like I said, it can be slow and difficult to come by. And as we've already hit on, the snapshot in time is prov proving to be less and less effective as these threat actors get more and more creative and dynamic with their approach. Um, so I think that snapshot in time part really needs to evolve to be a more continuous thing. That said, as we as we mentioned, these teams are also already stretched thin and overtaxed, and this can be an expensive investment. And so the tools that make that investment a little bit cheaper also have some weaknesses that we need to mitigate in themselves as well, right? The security ratings have a limited, a limited visibility. The GRC tools don't always have the data you need to make the most appropriate decision at the point in time. Relying on internal tooling is extremely expensive and not always as effective or timely as you need it to be. So for me, it just kind of comes back to this, this myriad of tools coming together to give you kind of a one-stop shop, mm -hmm. best of all worlds approach so mm -hmm. that you can have that 360 degree view. You're not reliant on one tool or another. You're not reliant on one source that may fall down or be delayed. And you can supplement the weaknesses of the tools that you are using with the strengths of additional tools. And so you're never just in a jam because something you know, fail to deliver or somebody was slow to respond, you have other things to fall back on if your primary source of information isn't delivering for some reason. And having, I think, a broader arsenal to attack what's not working in the past is, is probably our best way forward. Um, but I think we also need to continue to make those tools as accessible and as intuitive as possible, because this is a very complex problem to solve. And if you can't understand the problem that you're solving, it's going to be really, really hard to know what success looks like and to feel like that success mm -hmm. is attainable. So I think there's a much broader conversation needing to be had, not only about the methodology of, of cyber risk management, but really the accessibility um, and the approachability and the communication of how we are making this program strong and why it matters beyond the cybersecurity teams themselves. Mm -hmm. So exactly. Christy, what do you think? Do you want to add something? Actually, I totally agree with uh, what uh, Courtney said, but uh, actually what I want to add is uh, the part of what the organization is somehow doing wrong to day and I can only speak from my point of view mm -hmm. is that we are talking uh, for doing the full cyber uh, the threat assessment of the all uh, third party vendors the thing is what I'm seeing happening very often is that these third party vendors are being completely uh, left behind and are doing just this uh, the same questionnaire one years uh, every one year for example but the thing is um, this type of problems or this type of risk assessments plans that we want to implement, they are not done uh, regularly. And the people that implement these third party vendors into their own integrations, into their whole business processes, basically, they often tend to overlook ads. So basically, they don't do a complete check on them. They don't do a complete risk assessment on them. And that's exactly what we should not do. And if they, for example, take a third party vendor and they want to integrate it immediately, 
one thing that they forget about is to do the full risk assessment before and then they end up with, for example, a software at the end of the day with uh, 200 third components uh, completely integrated into them and the risk assessment is not done and they will be doing the risk assessment after the whole product is created. So that's the wrong approach. We should take this kind of approach and just leave it behind in the past. And when we are creating a software to do a full proper analysis at the beginning of it, where we take each and every single third party vendor, do a full analysis of that, of all the risk analysis that there is and the risk assessment, and then proceed on with the other steps of creating a product on itself or just not only the product, but for the business in itself before uh, taking on the third party vendor. So it's all about the approach. It's all about the mindset and it's all about the people that want to uh, integrate this mindset in their own uh, working process in itself. Mm -hmm. So, so Christy, uh, uh, what is your final recommendations for optimizing a third party cyber uh, risk management program? Uh, just to summarize your, your thoughts. Well, as I said, just proactive approach. I think this is the only reason, the only sentence that can uh, completely summarize it to be completely proactive. Don't leave it at behind. Don't leave it at the end of the stage if you're going to do a third-party vendor risk uh, management plan. It's important and people should not uh, have the tendency to overlook at it. Mm -hmm. It should be one of the crucial things since we are talking about today and we are talking about businesses that are using even more third-party vendors to adapt to their own uh, work processes. Mm -hmm. Courtney, what do you think? You know, I think in addition to everything we've kind of captured here as far as the optimization of your team and your resources and your tools and staying dynamic, staying proactive, that's all very, very important. But to kind of pull on the thread that Christy put out there, one thing that frustrates me the most is this disconnect between the value of cybersecurity and the actions that those teams are taking to business value. And we need to get okay. better at weaving a story that really proves that security value is business value. And True. it shouldn't just be the cybersecurity team trying to impress upon their internal stakeholders, their leadership, the importance of this. It really should become something that is so self-evident. It's more yeah. of a cohesive and cooperative effort. Um, and I think that would really help in some of the challenges that we're seeing with these teams and just a better understanding across the board. Again, I understand it's a complex problem. We don't expect everyone to be experts, but we do expect everyone to understand what's at risk here mm. and, and have it be a more, like I said, a more cooperative thing. It's not just one team trying to drive an entire organization to recognize what's at stake. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't, I don't see any comments or uh, questions from the audience. If someone has something to say, you can use the chat right now, or um, even uh, because the, this uh, webinar is recorded, actually, um, we're going to publish it online. So if anyone watch it later on and has something to say or to, um, I don't know, to discuss, to comment, uh, feel free to share your thoughts with us. And if you have something like a suggestion for a follow up uh, meeting, uh, we would love to hear your thoughts. So I, I want you, Courtney, to maybe summarize the whole idea of how to prioritize the third uh, part risks here and give us, you know, something like, like a conclusion advice for our audience. Absolutely. I think if you're going to have if you're going to have a limited set of resources to tackle a big problem, the best thing that you can do is have effective prioritization. I cannot stress enough the importance of understanding who is your priority from a vendor perspective, what areas of control coverage is a priority from your relationship as an organization, and then optimize your resource plan. So like I said, that meaningful impact is really, really important. You don't want to do a lot of things very, very weakly that ultimately don't have a significant result in your security. So having a good understanding on what matters to you when and why is going to help you make the best decisions. It's going to help you tell that story to the rest of your business as to why it's important and why they should continue to invest in this area of the, of the organization and give you a lot more confidence in expending that investment um, wherever that, that result proves. So if there is something in that sequence of activities that I, I laid out at a high level that you find difficult to do, I would only encourage people to find a way to resolve that difficulty as best as possible. If you don't know who your vendors are, there are tools that can help you. CyberDirects can help you with doing something like that. If you don't know what capacity you're using that vendor, you need to find that out. And then you need to align those use cases with what is, is 
leading to a vulnerability for your organization. Um, and then like Chrissy said, just staying on top of it, being proactive and asking for those additional resources if it's proving outside your bounds, because this is a business value consideration and this is something that's going to have a, a meaningful impact on your organization as a whole. And we want to we want to get in front of that problem before we're having to do you know, reactionary investments instead, because that's uh, a lot less of a satisfying activity to have to, to go forth on. Perfect conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Want to add something, Christy, to that? Actually, she said she completely summarized everything, every single point of it, and I wouldn't remove every single thing that she said. It's <laughs> on top, yeah. Well, thank you both for being here with us. Thank you all for joining our conversation. And uh, I, I really want to thank you, Courtney, for your valuable time and all your insights. And thank you, Christy, for being here with us and discuss this really interesting topic. I would like to wish you uh, the best of luck, take care. And as I said earlier before, if someone has anything to say, to comment, just feel free to find us on social media, just to email us and find any other uh, appropriate way to communicate with us. And we will be glad to uh, start a new conversation. So thank you, Gertney. Thank you, Christy.